So last week, Isaiah 6, seraphim shouting, holy, 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 doorposts shaking, temple filled with smoke, an awesome, awesome vision that Isaiah had of the holiness of God. And maybe you look at that and you go, well, there's no way I can be holy. <laughs> Not like that. But here's the thing. When we look in the Bible, we are, to be, we are commanded to be holy like God. But just as he, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. We are to be holy, and we are to be holy like God, because God is holy. Another way of putting it is that we are supposed to bear a family resemblance to our Father, right? We're supposed to look like Him eventually. I'm not saying day one of Christian, oh, be holy like God right now, all the way. You won't be. I mean, we should desire that. But as God works in you throughout your life, He's going to draw you into being more and more holy like He is. Well, what is holiness? We defined it last week. We said to be holy, whether it's a person, animal, or thing, means to be separated from the ordinary and devoted to God. And in the context of 1 Peter, um, to be holy means to be separated, especially from sin. Uh, if you look back a couple verses uh, in the same chapter, Verse 13 says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires when you, th th that you had when you lived in ignorance. And then he goes on to say, Be holy, just like God is holy. So, According to our definition, though, being holy is not just separating from sin. It is also separating to God. It devoting ourselves to God and to righteousness. Early in my Christian walk, like within the first year, um, someone gave me a book by Jerry Bridges, this book here, The Pursuit of Holiness. In the inside cover has 1991 written in it, so I know it was, was about a year after I was saved. And it, it was an incredibly influential, influential book in my Christian life, in my Christian walk. I've read it several times since then, but that first read-through was so vital. Jerry Bridges defined holiness this way. He said, to be holy is to be morally blameless. It is to be separated from sin and therefore consecrated or devoted was the word I was using, to God. The word signifies separation to God and the conduct befitting those who are separated. And, and so he goes on in the book and he talks about Christians who, who have what he called a cultural holiness. He says that these people adapt to the character and behavior pattern of Christians around them, or at least people who say they're Christians, as the Christian culture around them is more or less holy, so these Christians are more or less holy. In other words, they look, Paul's doing it. He does it all the time. So why can't I do it? In fact, not only does Paul do it, Jeff does it, Bill does it, Debbie does it, Chet does it, Leroy does it, Gray does it, and he used to be a pastor. <laughs> and, and that's cultural holiness, you see. It, it, it's looking at other people and saying, well, somebody told me this, 
billions of Christians don't attend church and they have a fine relationship with God. And I want to say, if millions of Christians jumped in front of buses with you, it's the same thing. What matters is not what millions of Christians are supposedly doing. It's what does the Bible say. Amen. That needs to be our standard. God's holiness. And, and just, I've noticed in my ministry, which is still just over half of what Gray's ministry was, but it's getting there. Um, I noticed a remarkable decline in Christian morality among Christians, not those heathens out there that Christians always talk about. <laughs> But, but in speech, I see a lot more Christians cussing and swearing and using disrespectful speech. Sexual purity. The, the Christians don't even blink anymore at the idea, oh, it's, it's fine to live together before being married. I, I mean, that's out the window. A lack of respect for authority. In fact, it seems that if you are a real Christian today, you don't respect authority. And that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. And we do this because everyone else does it. That's our excuse. And if everyone's doing it, then it must be okay. And that, that's cultural holiness. That's what Jerry Bridges... I don't know when that book was written. I think it was written in the 70s when he defined and he saw this cultural holiness. It's been a long time ago, 50 years. What does the Bible say, though? It says, be holy like God is holy. There's our standard. God must define our definition of holiness or there is no real holiness. Amen. In God, there is a complete absence of evil and sin. God hates sin. In fact, one of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 6, 19, 16 to 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. One, one reason I like it is, is that it comes out bluntly and say there are things that the Lord, and we go, well, he's not too fond of, uh, he dislikes, he doesn't encourage you to do. No, he hates and detests. Strong language. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Uh, you look at that and you go, wait a minute, he just threw lying and murder together. He hates them the same. And so, so God hates sin, and what we should do is we should cultivate in our hearts a hatred of, and mark this little three-letter word, of our sin. We're very good at hating other people's sin. But we need to work on hating our sin. And to do this, we don't focus on the sin. We focus on the holiness of God. We focus on God himself. We ought to frequently study that holiness. Come back to Isaiah 6 or Revelation 4 and many other passages in the Bible. And, and, and meditate frequently on them. Read the Bible about it. Read good books like, like uh, The Pursuit of Holiness about God's holiness. Um, and, and get a sense of how holy God is and you will automatically start hating your sin. Be holy. Another book that influenced me early in my Christian walk was John MacArthur's um, Vanishing Conscience. Um, I, I got rid of a lot of books when we moved last, the last move we did, because most of my books are on my iPad now. In fact, this book's on my iPad, but there are some books 
that are marked up in certain ways or they're just, I guess the word is sentimental to me, that I've kept around. And this is one of them. It's dated 1996. I had been a Christian for five years. And when I was writing this sermon, the chapter in, in that um, book that's most memorable to me came back to me. It's called Hacking Agag to Pieces. Just, <laughs> and it, it, it's about one of the stories in the Bible that teaches us how seriously God treats sin. And so turn to 1 Samuel. I want to have you get eyes on this and maybe it will be one of those um, touch point scriptures for you with this whole idea of sin. And we'll read some verses up there. We won't read the entire chapter, but we'll, we'll hit some of the big ones and get the story out. Samuel said to Saul, verse 1, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So now listen to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as, as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. So, so right away, you see, this is a tough story for some of us to read. It's a tough story because it brings up those issues of like, this just sounds like genocide. This doesn't sound very, very, very loving of God at all. But remember that God wanted, wants justice doled out. And he has a right to dole out justice on whom, when he pleases. And in this case, he, he wanted to use Saul and the Israelite army to do that. In this case, it's not always the case. God's instructions were very clear. Destroy everyone and everything. Don't keep anything. Don't keep any of the stuff. Don't let anyone live. And Saul went into battle, but did he obey the Lord? Verse 9. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. <laughs> so here we have a classic human response, right? Oh, well, there's some good stuff here. Let's not throw out everything. I mean, yeah, okay, let's keep it. I mean, we could sell it at a yard sale or something like that. Um, or on eBay and get some money out of it. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. Why did Saul save Agag, the king? And frankly, we're not told. But, but some guesses would be maybe Saul wanted to display him as a trophy. I mean, that's what kings who conquered other kings liked to do back then drag them around through the cities and see, look what I did. Or maybe, maybe he felt mercy on a fellow king. Maybe he thought, hey, he's, we're kind of the same, so I'll have mercy on him. I, we don't know. How did God react to Saul's disobedience? Verse 13, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I carried out the Lord's instructions. Remember that Proverbs 6 thing about the lying tongue? Oh, no. <laughs> but Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of the cattle I hear? Saul pulls an Eve or an Adam. He blames someone else. Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. So he, now he blamed someone else and he says, but, but we're going we're gonna to use this to sacrifice to the Lord. He's going to like this. He's really going to like this, this stuff. It's almost like um, 
Um, you know, sometimes Christians will, will gamble, play the lottery and whatever. Because they say, I'll tithe this to the church. And I'll tie 20% to the church even. And, and, and I'm, I'm here to say that if you do that, and I find out where that came from, I'll return it. I will return it. Don't try to buy God's favor for your sin. And that's what he's trying to do. That's what he's trying to do. Samuel says, Saul, you have disobeyed the Lord. You disobeyed him. And Saul returns and, and he says, but, verse 20, but I did obey the Lord. I mean, sometimes when we're in the midst of sin, we get delusional. We don't know what we're saying. Um, Saul said, I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag their king. Therefore, I did not completely destroy them. The soldiers, again, those other guys, took sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God and kill God. So see, I did. And Samuel presses Saul on the importance of obeying the Lord. And, and Saul repents of his sin, although that's debated. Commentators go back and forth. Was it a godly sorrow or worldly sorrow? And then Saul says to Samuel in verse 24, he says, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. And I was, I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Again, we, you know, People debate whether he was sincere or not. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord. The Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Well, what about Agag? That poor guy, he's all tied up going, hmm, oh, hmm, oh, hmm, oh. Verse 32, then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him in chains. He, he, he thought, surely the bitterness of death, death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among the women. And Samuel put Agag to death, literally hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. It, 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 it seems like such a merciless act. I, I guess I would never want to be on Samuel's bad side. <laughs> right? But remember, God was delivering <clears throat> fair justice on someone who deserved it to people who had showed no mercy to Israel. And, and as Samuel even alludes to, who had made mothers childless. And so this, this, was, this was God being just with them and doling out his justice on them. And that's sometimes hard for us to grasp. A couple lessons I want to bring away from the story. There's probably a lot more in there. But a couple. First of all, and this is what MacArthur does in that chapter. He turns the story around and puts it on us. We are Saul. Our sin is Agag. And so we cannot allow bits of sin to live here and there in our lives. We can't say, well, this, I know this is a sin, but, but it's, it has good benefits, you know? It's, it's a necessary evil. You know, it's a, we have all sorts of, of little things that we say to rationalize it. But all sin must be eradicated in your life. 
Don't become content with the sin in your life. And the second lesson is we must be killing sin like Agag was killing was killed. Um, sometimes, again, Christians look at these stories and wonder, okay, I can barely accept the fact that that uh, you know God's doing this to other people. Okay, I got that. I got that. Now, am I supposed to dole out God's justice for, on behalf of him? And the answer is no. No. We are called to do that in the New Testament. That's Old Testament. That's a nation of Israel. We are not a nation. We are a church. And we follow a different uh, Jesus' um, pattern. And what's his pattern? His pattern is love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Be a gentle teacher. Pray for them in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. And like I've said, when you look at these Old Testament stories, and you go, whew, oh, this is bad stuff. Joshua is another book full of it. Flip it and say, okay, the enemy here is my sin. That is what needs to be eradicated in my life. And, and what Joshua or Samuel or, or who, whoever the story is about is teaching me, is teaching me how I'm supposed to respond to my sin in my life. Because that's how God wants to deal with it. He wants to have that eradicated. He wants justice done. And, and, and he has done that in Jesus Christ. His justice has been poured out on Jesus Amen. for our sins. Um, and, 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 and we'll get in just a moment here looking at how that has changed us. But, but I want to stop here and say that if you've never come to the point in your life where you've actually admitted your sin, and there are people who do that, they, they will say that, yes, I've made mistakes and stuff, but they will never come to the point where they say that my sin is something that God needs to eradicate because it is so offensive to him that it, is, it needs to be detested and hated. If you've never come to that point where you think, my goodness, I am going to die, I am going to spend an eternity in hell forever, That's, unless something happens. And, and maybe you've tried to say, well, I'm better than Dan. I'm a whole lot better than Dan, and so maybe God will accept me because I'm better than Dan. And, and, and we try stuff like that. We try the comparison thing. We try the rationalization of our sin. I need to, I, this is just the way I am. You know, God made me this way, and so, so if he wants me to change, he's going to have to come down in person and change me. Ever tried that one before? You can get away with a lot that way. If, if, you, if you finally have come past that to the point where I can't save myself. I can't do it. Then you're ready for Jesus. Then you're ready for the sacrificial lamb God slew on you, the cross for your sin and your forgiveness. And then you can accept him, you can receive him, you can believe in him, you can trust him, you can have faith, and then you will be justified. And you will have peace with God. Romans 5.1 <laughs> Why does it say you will have peace with God? Because God wants to do this to your sin. God, God wants to hack it to pieces 
like Samuel, hack Agag to pieces. And that's why you need peace with God, buddy. Is there, is there a word for, I mean, buddy is a male term. Is there buddress? For <laughs> <laughs> each other, buddy. <laughs> I've always wondered about that. So if you've never received Christ like that, it's something that I urge you to do. Amen. I urge you to come to Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and place your trust completely in Him. But as Christians, we still struggle with that sin. It still comes up and we need to deal with it. Like yes. it's an egg egg. God says we are to put to death or mortify sin in our, in our, in our bodies. Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So, so what this story teaches us is that we need to take sin seriously. First of all, by coming to Christ, because there's no way we're going to deal with our sin by ourselves. But then second, also, as Christians, still taking it seriously. Um, we cannot settle for partial obedience. We cannot settle for buying God off with good works or donations to the church. Um, our attitude towards our sin needs to be one of utter seriousness. How do we develop holiness? Well, Romans 6. You might want to turn there in your Bibles too. I've got them up on the screen, but this is another important chapter in this whole discussion. Romans 6. We only got time to look at a few verses, but they should be enough to get you started. Romans 6, 6 through 7, for we know that our old self, our old body, our old man was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So, so when you become a Christian, what Paul is saying here is that your old self is crucified with Christ. Um, you are set free from sin. You are no longer a slave to sin. Now, the, the phrase there might be done away with up there. Doesn't mean destroy completely. But it means rendered powerless. So as Christians, we still have that sin hanging around. It's, it's not completely wiped out. Not yet. Not in this life. But it is rendered powerless if you let it be powerless. And this is a fact, whether you realize it or not. And so... Um, Paul says in verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word for count is a mental word. It means to reason or to consider or um, the old King James used the word reckon, which was kind of fun to preach. Um, that, that word really preached. I reckon him dead to sin. Um, Consider yourselves dead unto sin. It's already true. You are dead to sin. It's been crucified. Amen. To count yourselves dead to sin and alive with Christ means to believe that it's true and then to act on that truth. Okay? It's an act of faith in God. It's an act of faith in God's Word. You read Romans 6, and Romans 6 says it's been crucified, and so therefore you believe it. And you act on that. When we count ourselves dead to sin, what we're doing is we're denying sin the opportunity to reign in our bodies. And verse, um, verse 12, 
It says this, therefore do not let rain, let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. The word for reign means to rule over someone. And that's what sin wants to do. Sin has been rendered powerless, but it still says, hmm, I bet I can get Alan to let me reign in his heart. And, and so sin goes around and, and, and tries to get us to allow it um, the ability to have power. He doesn't want to give up the throne. Now, another way of understanding this is habits. That's a word we would use today, habits. And why do we still sin? Well, partly it has to do with habits that we've developed over the years. And then, like I was saved when I was 19. So I had 19 years of bad habits. And then I developed a few since then too. Um, but habits, as you know, if you've ever tried to lose weight, if you've ever tried to quit a bad habit, they're hard to break. Even though we have all the tools and everything in the world to not do those habits, we still give in to them. And sins like that. It's as if we've been in a jail cell for years, like Nolan is here. Um, <laughs> this, this is in Deer Lodge, the state prison museum. But you see the doors open, and kid won't come out. It just stays in there. And, and that's how we are with our sin. We've been set free, the jail doors open, and we said, this cop feels pretty good at that. I've been sitting here a long time, and it just feels good. It feels right. We'll, but Romans 6.12 is a command to us. Do not let. Something you need to do. God's forgiven you. He saved you. He set you free from sin. He's crucified your old self. Now you must appropriate that truth and walk out of the cell. And walk in it. Okay? Um... One study Bible I was reading said this, but we also need to live out this new relationship, our new relationship with Christ and our new relationship with our sin, by thinking about ourselves in a new way, that's verse 11, and by acting in accordance with our new status, verse 12 and 13. So it's, it's both things there. It's going to be hard. Because we're creatures of habit. We're, we're set free from sin, but we by habit still do them. It's like the thing we want to keep doing. And so we need to train ourselves to have godly habits. And uh, that's why Paul writes in, in 1 Timothy, he says, Have nothing to do with godless, godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself. The, 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 the Greek word for train is gymnasium. We get our word gymnasium from it. So it's an exercise, athletic, sports word. Everyone here likes sports, right? I mean, I hear a lot of sports talk. That's what it's talking about. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value. It's not bad. It's got some value. But godliness has value for all things, all areas of your life, holding promise both for the present life, the life you're living right now, godliness is kind of a good thing to have, and the life to come. Another book that influenced me greatly when I was a young Christian, this sermon's going to be called the book sermon, um, well, it's called Disciplines of a Godly Man. I got this one in 92. And what he does is he goes through all sorts of spiritual disciplines. Everything, prayer, Bible reading, how to be a husband, how to be a father, all those things. Great book. I think his wife wrote one for women. Um, but in, in, in the book, he begins with this story. He says, sometime 
In the early summer before entering the seventh grade, I wandered over from the baseball field and picked up a tennis racket for the first time. And that fall, I determined to become a tennis player. I was disciplined. I played every day after school, except during basketball season, and every weekend. In the next two summers, I took lessons, played some tournaments, uh, and practiced about 60 hours a day doing tennis. Wow. And I became good. Good enough that as a 12 and a half year old, 110 pound freshman, I was the second man in the varsity tennis team of my 3,000 student California high school. Impressive. But here's what he learned. He learned that personal discipline is an indispensable key for accomplishing anything in this life. Kent Hughes did this to learn tennis, a game. It's a game. It has no eternal consequences, except for a few people who are really on top of these things no one will remember the winner of the Super Bowl next year or the year after or whatever because they're not that important. Never mind, we spent millions of dollars and a lot of arguing about that. Okay? We are not in a game. What we do as Christians has eternal consequences. Yes, I know. Sometimes I say, I'm a pastor. People look at me with sympathy and go, sorry you wasted your life like that. You know, I don't think I wasted my life. No. We are not in a game. What we're doing has eternal consequences. And so therefore, we should want this more than anything else on earth. We should want to be holy more than anything. Even, even learning tennis and getting good at tennis. That is of some value, Timothy says, or Paul says to Timothy. But godliness and holiness, that's good <laughs> for both this life and the life to come. So this week, <clears throat> go to your coach. Who's your coach? God. Jesus. Yeah, God, Jesus. Go to your coach, and I dare you to ask him. I dare you. What do I need to do to improve my game? What do I need to work on? Maybe you've been kind of coasting and thinking, I'm doing pretty well. I mean, after all, there's Trussie, a whole lot better than she is. I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> I've seen what you do. No. I dare you to ask God, your coach, for a game plan for your improvement and holiness. And remember, you know, he, he's going to be there to help you. I have these, have you noticed that, the, 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 have you ever tried to work out by yourself? I, I've got dumbbells sitting in my bedroom gathering dust. Once in a while, pick them up. But you, you know what would help a lot? If somebody came, and don't do this, <laughs> if somebody came over at 8 o'clock every morning and said, all right, Levi, get in the bedroom, grab the dumbbells, 20 reps, let's go. That would help a lot. And we have that. We have a coach. His name's Jesus. Ask him for the game plan. Ask him for help. Go to him. We also can depend on the church, the community of believers. In fact, we're supposed to. 
the Christian life isn't supposed to be lived as a lone wolf. We're supposed to have a community of believers surrounding us to, to, to help us train. Have you noticed that you know, in this day and age, there are people go to the gym together. There's gym, gyms and training facilities. There's one in uh, Planet Fitness in Missoula. You, you look in the window and you just see all these people all together training together, lifting weights and stuff like that. Why are they doing that? Why not just do it in their bedroom by themselves? Because a community helps you train. That's why we need the church um, that the Bible says um, here. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart. Did you notice he says, see to it, brothers and sisters, see to it, Christians, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. That's quite a warning, isn't it? It's like we can get real messed up as Christians. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You can't live the Christian life well alone. Period. Yeah, you need quiet times alone with God. But you need the church and fellow Christians in your life as well. So, um, if you've been missing church or if you've been missing small group accountability, if you've been missing large group corporate worship, if you've been missing that in your life, then I challenge you this week, get involved. Get involved. And not on a superficial level, not talking about hunting wolves or, or sports or whatever, but having Christ-centered conversations about what it means to be holy. Be holy because God is holy. You can do that by allowing the coach to train you and by being involved at the gym or the church in this case. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Um, Lord, there's a lot more that could, could be said about holiness, of course. We just barely touched some of the some of the mountain peaks of it. And, and Lord, I, I pray for these folks here today. I pray that you would help them to dig down deeper. Um, the, take this as a jumping off point in, in their training, in their, their discipline, in their relationship with you, Lord. Help them to see that, that you've defeated sin in their life and, and help us all to see that we're the ones responsible for making sure that the, the sin doesn't reign anymore in our lives. We need you, Lord, to help us. We need the church to help. So, Lord, I just pray for that in each one here today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand for the benediction. This is another one that just fits the sermon so well. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you completely. What does sanctify mean? Made holy. Made holy. To make you holy. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept flameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ.